recording. And again, good morning. Um, this is MED 140 8DAX, uh, and it is uh, today's date is the 19th, and it is Friday morning. Welcome, welcome. And this week's topic is chapter 57, and I have uh, um, uh, an older lecture. Uh, that you have here, uh, and we're going to be talking about um, uh, emergencies. Now, you, if you look here, uh, and of course, what's due today is uh, uh, discussion three and homework three. So, by closing a business, hopefully, I'll see um, uh, other stuff and also uh, submission for homework. And remember, uh, it's due today, so every day that it, uh, um, that's late, it we cut off a grade. Um, so uh, please submit uh, by closing a business. So uh, if you look at uh, these uh, blood pressure and practical pulse and respiration and mensuration, which is measurements, we'll be going over this in laboratory. I'll be posting later on this afternoon uh, our laboratory dates. And again, like I mentioned in previous lectures, if you cannot make the official laboratory date, that's okay. If you have work or something else that's going on, shoot me an email. Uh, we also have Saturday morning makeup dates. And also I'll be available on, available on campus on other dates starting week six. Uh, so in, in about a week from now, uh, we'll be, uh, um, uh, there'll be other laboratories that are on campus and there's going to be some uh, some guidelines that mirror you know the CDC guidelines you know when you go outside uh, you know the social distancing and then we'll be wearing gloves we'll also be wearing uh, uh, masks as mask as well and and um, also the uh, the announcement that I'll be putting up will also outline like what exactly will we be practicing in a uh, laboratory. Now you also see there's a practice midterm. Uh, next week is week five. I will be posting the midterm uh, and it'll be like, a, it'll be a take home midterm uh, essentially. And it'll be based on all the notes and, um, and it, it'll be more like a homework. Okay, and the same thing for the final written exam. It'll be more like a take home assignment. Um, probably 50 items, multiple, uh, multiple choice, and it's based on the lectures and it's based on the notes uh, and your textbook uh, from day one through and including uh, week four or topic four, this topic here. So let's jump to chapter 57 in our textbook. And the textbook is here, of course. Uh, and then you click on that and it is the, remember it is this, this, this textbook, this red one. And the blue one, remember, is uh, that has procedures and it has extra um, multiple choice and fill in questions that um, you could use to prepare for your, um, uh, you know, uh, AMA or AMT exams, like your CCMA and your RMA. Okay, and if you also would like to have uh, like, an actual review, uh, um, uh, like one-on-one, -on -one. you could uh, give me a call regarding tutoring and uh, we could do that as well. So let's find chapter 57 and it should be in the, let's go down here. It should be in the section, not with diagnostics, here, therapeutics. Nope, it's in medical, it's in unit nine, uh, medical assisting practice. So you click on that little arrow that's on the side of the unit nine, and then you'll find uh, these drop downs, chapter 57, uh, emergency preparedness. Now, if you have um, uh, a lot of this stuff that's in here also has uh, items that if you took your basic life support, CPR and first aid course, um, uh, you should know uh, some things in here. And if you haven't taken uh, a first aid, a basic life support and CPR course, um, 
uh, many people just take, you know, the, the really cheap one that's like $27 and that only has like CPR. Um, that one's nice and it's good enough for you to go to your externship and whatnot. But there's another one that has both uh, CPR, AED, and um, first aid. Try, try to take that one. It's a little bit more pricey, but uh, it, it's, it's, for, uh, it's the one that um, medical professionals take uh, that, has, that also includes first aid. And it's, it's good. It's nice, it's nice to have. Okay, so as always, let's jump to uh, the case. And uh, we already know that uh, about S, O, A, and P. S is the subjective. That's our history. O is the objective, that's our physical examination and our laboratories, our evidence of what's going on. A is the assessment or diagnosis, and P is the plan, what are we gonna do? So uh, when you see a case, right, and you could see one in your midterm or your final, um, it, or, and the cases that we go over and the chapters that we go over, even if we don't go over it, you should, you should take a look at them because that's actually how, you know, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of clinical experience, that's actually how you're gonna learn. So let's look at this. Uh, Mr. Nassar is a 15-year-old male student, and I always add their occupation. And again, uh, we always add the occupation so, so that um, we understand uh, particular risk factors, right? Uh, like for example, a 15-year-old male, if, it, if it's in a rural, uh, well, heck, even if it's a rural and or um, suburban, uh, you're thinking what? Um, increased sexual activity, in, uh, increased potential for illicit drug use, especially in an urban environment. Uh, but I've also worked in rural environments. It's amazing, like if you're, uh, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, how much drugs uh, people use, especially if you're in the middle of nowhere with nothing to do. So he's a returning patient, so he has a history. Uh, chief complaint is flu-like symptoms, uh, which include fever and chills. Now, this fever, if uh, Mr. Muhammad, uh, Mr. Nassar, right, uh, and or his mom uh, told us, this is more like a, a symptom at this point because we don't know uh, if someone took his temperature properly, and we don't know what if he really had chills or muscle aches. Uh, because it may not be presenting right now. So the, uh, so the chief complaint, uh, there's more like uh, symptoms because it's what he previously experienced. He has a past medical history or PMH of asthma, which has been relatively stable and he has, he's, on, he's currently on albuterol. Eight milligrams BID twice a day. Uh, Mr. Nassar uh, states he's feel, he feels like he's freezing. Uh, and this is another thing. He's now the eighth person who walked in our clinic or our ward who has similar uh, symptoms. And the other uh, patients are now um, uh, positive for influenza type A. So it looks like a little, uh, um, uh, uh, a small localized uh, um, uh, epidemic is going on. Now, since influenza, just like coronaviridae or coronavirus, also known as SARS-2, right? Uh, they both have a very, very bad predilection for lung tissue, okay? And, and so now it may exacerbate any asthmatic problems. And you can see here, right? Just like COVID, he is an immunocompromised patient with a past medical history of asthma, and it looks like he's not the first time he's been to our clinic, right? So uh, having, uh, having the flu uh, is, is dangerous. Uh, and remember, uh, just, just your typical flu, uh, which no one really noticed uh, before uh, all this stuff went on, killed over 27,000 people in this country last year. The office manager informs you that the local health department has been notified because that's what we have to do every time we have we start noticing a pattern of a whole bunch of people get sick. And and I assume he's in his emergency department. Well, he went to the emergency department. 
Here's another thing about most patients. They go into an emergency department because it's either off hours. And that's why nowadays we have things like patients first. And also we have emergency departments that have sections or subsections within the emergency department that may not be an emergency. But this is now considered an emergency because you have a high risk patient who has now a, uh, a um, uh, and especially if he tests positive, oh, he tested positive, now he, he's what? He's a very, very high risk for, for dyspnea. So you can see now uh, that um, um, any risk to the cardiovascular system, whether the lungs or the heart or the ability to get oxygen into the system, because that is one of the telltale signs of what a true emergency is, okay? And how do we know? Uh, one thing that the nurse and the healthcare administrators do in a hospital or any setting is they triage the patient. So in an emergency ward, or even if you're in your office, you have to, uh, whoever's at the front desk has to be able to understand and triage the patient. Now, this particular patient with a potential for dyspnea and potential for respiratory distress to respiratory arrest, that person will go ahead of, Mr. Nassar will go ahead of me who has a broken arm. Now, even though my broken arm is painful, right? I'm in, I'm in equal distress. I'm crying, it hurts and it looks messed up. But if you look at the triage, it goes, am I going to die? No, therefore, Mr. Nassar, who has a greater chance, uh, a greater chance of, of cardiovascular uh, problems, he will go in ahead of me. And you can only imagine what, uh, how, uh, what kind of uh, social issues that causes within the emergency room or within your ward, especially if I had a broken arm and I've been waiting all morning, and then uh, Mr. Nassar got seen 20 minutes and gets to go in, okay? And those are one of the things that you also have to deal with. One thing also about your office, uh, especially if you're in an office setting, you have to know uh, all your emergency protocols. Okay, have your numbers, who to call, when should you call, okay? Uh, and again, now you can see a true emergency is something that will affect either your cardiac or your vascular, uh, cardiovascular and or uh, respiratory uh, issues that will cause potential death. Okay, and one thing you'll also have is some sort of uh, crash cart, which is uh, not all the time it's a, a rolling medical supply, but you should know where all your medical supplies are and all your emergency supplies are, um, um, and pretty much how to use it or who to call uh, to use it. Now, if it's an emergency situation, uh, actually, when I was a medical assistant, you're going to get nervous. And it's going to be, it's going to go fast. So when you activate the EMS system, right, the emergency emergency medical system, you call 911. Uh, I actually had a little card or a little piece of paper that was taped to my desk where you have to go through this spiel, right? So name uh, goes, you have to have your name, the telephone number, location, right? It's amazing, like when... Uh, when you're in an emergency situation, you forget things like your name or the address of where you are. You express the nature of emergency and number of people or your patient, the condition of the patient and also and or uh, vital signs and summary of what was done and directions on uh, um, now how to reach a location of emergency. But uh, that's if uh, the family wants to bring um, uh, bring the patient themselves, uh, which uh, which usually is an option, but uh, especially with your more geriatric patients, your older patients that came in on a, either a taxi or a service, um, and the, and if the service didn't uh, doesn't wait for them, uh, uh, you it goes uh, you'll definitely be calling an ambulance. And here's are some things you look them over, are, are typical in the contents of a first aid kit. Uh, but the best bet, if you're in a small mom and pop shop or a mom and pop office, or even if you're just in uh, your own regular office, um, OSHA or the Occupational Safety and Hazard Administration uh, has these recommended kits 
and they're relatively cheap. You can get them anywhere from eBay to Amazon. And they have like all of these things. Uh, and also another thing you should also have are some, uh, some basic emergency um, uh, medications like diphenhydramine, which is, uh, which is, um, uh, what do you call that? The generic, the generic name is diphenhydramine and the trade name is, uh, as we all know and love, uh, Benadryl, especially for somebody who could be going into anaphylaxis. So let's look at some guidelines, okay? Now, before any of this stuff, it, it's going to be stressful. So you have to remember your protocol and you have to be the calmest person in the room. Now, inside, internally, you're going to be freaking out. But that's okay. That's normal, right? But take a breath and run your protocol and look at things clinically, okay? So you have to have first do your inspection, overall general impression of the patient. Uh, and uh, then you have to access, assess uh, responsiveness. Now, if your patient is not answering you, let's say your patient fainted and is on the floor, um, uh, you have to elicit some pain. Now, the two uh, common ways to elicit pain is you rub on their sternum or you pinch like, you know, the corner of uh, their eyebrow. And uh, if they're stuporous, they should be able to respond. They'll do that. They're like, ah, why are you doing to me? Or they'll just moan or groan. And that means your patient is stuporous versus unconscious. If your patient's unconscious, they will not react. They'll just uh, uh, they'll, they'll just be there. They may be breathing. They may not be breathing. And again, you go through your CABs, circulate, uh, uh, circulation, airway, and breathing. That's from your CPR. Okay? Circulation, check for a pulse. Airway, does my patient have a patent airway? And lastly, are they breathing? And, uh, and then you do a head-to-toe assessment, okay? Uh, and we'll go over that when we go over physical examination. But this head-to-toe uh, assessment will be focused on the reason why they're on the ground, okay? And of course, uh, uh, at the end of the day, make sure you document everything that happened. And remember, the primary reason why we document everything is to legally prove that there was continuity of care, that we just didn't leave the person on the ground, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, if you had your medical law and ethics, there's a lot of legality, all right? Now, telephone emergencies. Now, here's this classic thing that, uh, that even the doctor's offices when, um, what do you call that? When they have uh, their uh, phone messages, they always state that, it goes, if you feel that this is an emergency, it goes, please call, please hang up and call 911 now, okay? So once you've made an assessment and it, and it looks like there is, there is a situation that may risk uh, the cardiovascular status of your patient, you tell them to call 911 or you, it goes, uh, you say something like, are you home? Mr. and Mrs. Uh, patient, okay. It goes, would you like for me to call 911, right? And then you call 911, and then you go through your spiel, uh, you know, the name, location, and all that, okay? This PPE stuff is really important, and we know that, because um, we wear PPE not necessarily for the viruses, because the viruses are very, very small, and they're going to go through anything. They'll go through skin, they'll go through cells. But the PPE is not, uh, has also a psychological effect on our patients and on our cells that we're being protected. Um, and the PPE is also for the, all the other associated pathogens that are much larger than, um, uh, uh, than a virus, like uh, all the funguses and all the bacteria, okay? Um, so that's why, and, uh, because if you have, if you're exposed to a lot of pathogens, your, um, your, your immune system is down. And also if you take a good look at the other PPE you wear, 
like uh, like your scrubs and your lab coat. This is like it's especially when it's brand new. It's kind of shiny and waxy. There's a there's a there's a, a anti it goes anti pathogenic spray that they spray on that stuff, and that's actually how you know you need new scrubs. Uh, when that when that shimmery feel or that waxy feel goes away uh, in your scrubs, then you're just pretty much wearing pajamas. Okay. Uh, and when in doubt, you always wear your PPE. And if you, you wear your PPE, you wear it in the facility. And then you swap it out when you go outside. You wear your street clothes. Uh, so, for example, if you're wearing a, your, your mask uh, in the ward or in the doctor's office, have another mask that you wear when you go home. Okay? Either dispose of the mask, most likely, uh, uh, when you're in um, the clinical setting, and then have another mask when, uh, when you go home, okay? And it's also the same thing. I find it very silly that when people wear lab coats or people wear scrubs to go to the mall or they're coming from work, you are now carrying whatever you got exposed to, to the mall or to your home. Actually, when I was practicing, um, I had a separate um, um, a laundry bin or hamper uh, for my clothes because I, uh, I was exposed to infectious people all day. And um, uh, uh, my wife ran uh, a separate load in a different, uh, at the laundromat, in a different machine than she did with, uh, um, with her stuff and my children. And it makes sense because uh, PPE is supposed to protect you. And it's not, it's not supposed to uh, carry on the infection to other locales locales okay uh and if it was bloody or there were any body fluids i would have the hospital wash it i wouldn't um uh the hospital also has their own um sanitation and uh, uh laundry services uh for staff okay now do not touch your eyes and mouth and things like that another thing is also is especially if you're in the doctor's office Another way to personally protect yourself is just to make your uh, area, especially things that people touch on a regular basis, like um, door handles and um, uh, keyboards and telephones. So all of these it goes, all of these things uh, you should in you should be especially nowadays you should be wiping down uh, before the shift and after the uh, after the shift. Uh, with a good, uh, with a good uh, approved disinfectant. Um, so PPE, gloves, goggles, gowns, uh, um, uh, and shields, right? Uh, that's part of your PPE. And again, I don't need to state that you should be sharing other people's stuff. Uh, it's amazing how many of those rules uh, um, years ago, prior to COVID, we used to violate all the time. Uh, how many times have you seen medical professionals come in? They're not really wearing the mask. They just put it over their mouth. Uh, I now have current horror stories from my, uh, uh, my externs and some of uh, uh, nurse candidates who are in their, um, uh, they're in their laboratories in the hospital, how a lot of medical professionals are taking shortcuts. Please don't be one of those people because it, um, it's dangerous okay so let's another thing about emergencies are uh accidental inter injuries actually now that people are walking around uh my wife is a healthcare administrator for uh, uh the anova medical group and um uh, a lot of her appointments and a lot of a lot of her patients now are coming in for uh these things that occur outside you know, like uh, there, there's a lot of tick bites and a lot of animal, like spider bites now um, uh, um, on top of uh, um, uh, the stuff that's going on right now. And uh, the way to deal with that is, uh, is to uh, make sure that if you get a bite or anything like that, you immediately report it and you get it to your doctor. And as it's happening, take a picture of it. And if there's a stinger or something, um, anytime you have any like puncture wound or anything like that, it is not advisable to take it out yourself. 
Uh, but you, you make sure a medical professional at least gets a look at it. And nowadays, you, you we have we have uh, cameras on our cell phones, so you um, you take the picture, and you know I get a call. And nowadays, there's a lot of teleconferencing. You could uh, conference in with your uh, doctor on Zoom or on Skype, and I've probably seen the doctor more than I care to. Uh, in the last couple of months um, because of now we can easily Skype, we can easily uh, Zoom each other. Now, the one thing of note regarding bites are animal bites, yes, it goes, uh, you have a potential uh, to get your uh, rabies booster, okay? That's one consideration regarding animal bites. But human bites are very, very different because human bites, the dirtiest place in the world is not your anus, it is your mouth. There are 250 potential pathogens in the human mouth, and also we have a potential of transmitting HIV. Uh, if you get bit, hepatitis. So those are the bloodborne pathogens, and uh, that it, it it takes on a different meaning now. So if someone gets into a fight, or and and let's say you punch somebody in the face and you cut your hand on their teeth. We're going to have to go through all these protocols and you're going to have to be tested on top of getting a rabies shot. And then on top of all of that, we also give you a prophylactic broad spectrum antibiotics. So human bites, you know, uh, be wary of those. Okay. Uh, snake bites, a rarity, but spider bites, again, they fall under um, uh, the category insect stings. Make sure uh, to, you know, as it's immediately happening, uh, take a take a picture of it, and uh, you know get it to your medical professional as soon as uh, as soon as possible. Because remember, anaphylaxis, which is an exaggerated immune response, if you're allergic to uh, like uh, insect stings, like um, like a bee or a wasp or something like that, um, your your throat and your cardiovascular system will close up real fast. Um, I had a patient when I was in EMS, he was running in Central Park and, um, he's allergic to bees and for, and you know, when you're running, you have your mouth open and you're sucking in air. Well, out of all the things that he swallowed was a bee, the bee panicked and he panicked and then the bee, um, uh, stung him in his throat. And then his throat closed up, everything closed up. And then the, uh, and then we found him unconscious uh, on the running path in um, um, in in Central Park, but it's good that I was in St. Vincent's Hospital on 59th Street, only three blocks away, and we were able to intubate the patient and uh, get the patient some epinephrine, and then to reduce the uh, the inflammation. And uh, we almost we barely didn't even have to take the ambulance. We could have actually just ran down the block to St. Vincent's Hospital on 59th. So the guy was lucky. Now burns. Now there are thermal burns, chemical burns, electrical burns, and they have also a classification via um, uh, via how much area uh, of the body is burned, and that is the rule of nine. So we classify, like if it's like the, the head for adults, it's like 9%, and then the front is 18. You see there are multiples of nine. Uh, with a child, they have bigger head, so it's 18, right? And uh, arms and legs are, are around nine. And for an adult, the arms are nine and the legs are 18. And that's why they call it the rules of, uh, rule of nine. We need to know the surface area of how much it was burned because then we can calculate how much dehydration and how much fluid loss. Now, it could be from a thermal, a chemical, electrical, and the emergency medical service needs to also know um, uh, what type of burn, what type of situation it was from. And if it's chemical, uh, if you're in a laboratory or some sort of industrial facility, even if you're in a laboratory, you'll see this big binder and it should be like like yellow and black or bright red 
they're gonna uh, um, they're gonna put some attention to it. You have uh, something called your MSDS, which is your material safety data sheet. It is a list of every chemical in the room and what to do if you're exposed to that chemical. So let's say like, oh, chemical A, right? Uh, oh, by the way, all the chemicals are listed and should be listed in alphabetical order. And there's like a protocol on, on what exactly you should put on every page. Let's say my patient was exposed to chemical A, right? You open up your MSDS, you go to A, you find that chemical, and there's instructions on what to do, right? And again, time is of the essence because burns, right, will start, uh, will start um, affecting the, uh, the layers of the skin. So when you report them, uh, you report them via the rule of nines. And the classification is, um, let's now look at the different degrees of burns. Okay, here's a nice picture. Now, first degree burns are relatively superficial, okay? And there's redness, there's pain, and, um, and it only affects the upper epidermal layers of skin. Now, second degree burns, they're still painful, and uh, you'll see that there's uh, formations of blisters. Now, a third degree burn, also known as a full thickness burn, the patient will not feel any pain because it burned all the way down to your subcutaneous level, which has nerves in it. And if you burn the nerves, you shouldn't be able to feel anything. Now, the two greatest problems with burns that we have is one, we already mentioned, dehydration. That's why you need to know the rule of nines. And the next problem is since our skin, is our first line of defense in our immune system. It keeps all the pathogens on the outside, on the outside. Well, when you have these burns, especially uh, second and third degree burns, and third degree is full thickness, um, another major concern of ours is uh, infection. So that looks like a beautiful both A and B question. What are the issues regarding burns? What are the two greatest things that we're most concerned about regarding a burn? is A, uh, uh, dehydration, and B, infection. And the two, go, and uh, of course, uh, how, how do you know how much uh, to report? Again, rule of nines. Now choking, if ever you've seen that video it says choking, uh, the universal sign of choking is somebody putting their hands on their, uh, uh, on their throat and, and flailing about now, Choking, the, how do you know your patient is choking? Your patient can't talk. The airway is completely blocked. And the only way you can make sound it goes, is if there's air. And if your airway is not patent, that means uh, you, have to, um, you have to start your uh, EMS and your CPR protocols. Okay? But just know that uh, that's a common question. What's the universal sign of choking? Uh, uh, back in the day, it used to be they, they had this picture of somebody holding their throat. But if ever you like, you go to YouTube fails, you look up YouTube, I, I, it's like my major source of comedy. Uh, you, you look at, uh, you know, uh, those videos where uh, people do a lot of failures. Uh, there was this young lady who tried to eat 14 cupcakes to impress her boyfriend or something. Who knows? Right? Uh, when she got down to like the fifth or sixth one, there, everyone was laughing. And she was still laughing too. And uh, what happened? Nothing's coming out of her airway. So she, what, what was she doing? She was choking. And then the video cut when, you know, everyone was uh, on top of her trying to dig out all the, um, uh, all the cupcake out of her uh, mouth and throat. Now, uh, ear trauma, eye trauma, if any time you have any uh, cut, laceration, or any foreign body, that's into your ear or into your eye, do not remove it. Just wrap it with a sterile dressing and get to the emergency room, emergency room as much as possible because removing the, the thing that got stuck in your ear or the thing that went through your eyeball will, uh, go, will make things worse, 
okay? Uh, the classic is like uh, some sort of missile projectile, like an arrow or a stick. Um, um, do not remove it, okay? Just wrap it around with a sterile dressing and, uh, and go to the emergency room as quick as possible. Now, the fall or fall from height, again, try to get as much history. And another thing about falls is not only the history of how they fell, where they fell, was it concrete, was it grass? Uh, another thing about a fall uh, was, or, or if somebody fainted, was their loss of consciousness or LOC, okay? That's really important, especially to the neurologist, okay? Because, um, and also the history on how exactly did they fall? Because if they fall because they fainted, it could be a respiratory problem, it could be a cardiovascular problem. Again, try to get as much history as you can and bring it, uh, bring it to the emergency room um, uh, uh, with you. Fractures, dislocations, sprains, and strains. The best is to immobilize the area, okay? And uh, that's with splints. And uh, don't try to reset it, don't try to put it back. Uh, I had a patient, um, he dislocated his shoulder and his buddies tried to put it back, which made it a million times worse, right? So uh, again, keep calm, limit the movement. You have to immobilize that area. And uh, you take your first aid class, um, uh, they teach you how to like use household items on how to immobilize something. Um, a classic example is... Um, uh, my son had a fall because he was playing. You know how children have that that, that game where they spin around and round and round. Well, uh, he was at the top of the stairs when he was doing that stupid game, and then he fell down the stairs, right? And then, um, um, out of all the things to hit, he hit his head on the last part of the stairs. You know how stairs sometimes have that little metal bracket to keep in uh, the carpet. Well, he hit the corner of that, right? And again, it's a fall. I had to note the height, uh, the situation, and uh, uh, what did we do? Um, we, we put him on a piece of wood so that he won't move his neck. And uh, from I actually utilized things that I learned in first aid. You, we took a whole bunch of um, towels and duct tape so he won't move his head, okay? Because that is another... A consideration on the fall is any damage to the cervical spine. And you'll see in, um, if you've been, ever been in an auto accident or seen people get into an ambulance and auto accident, the first thing that we put on their neck is a cervical collar. We are cervical collar. So something like this, right? So we could still uh, assess the airway, but if you don't have that, uh, you take the first aid class, you can take a bunch of towels and then tape and you could uh, immobilize um, their head and neck that way. Now, sprain and strain, uh, they're the same thing uh, before we get into the classifications of fractures. Um, a sprain or a strain is any um, overstretching of your joint space. Right. And you could see here, like you, you, you can take like pieces of sticks and things like that to immobilize the area. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you can take a book. Oh, boy. My son's awake. Hope he stays. Oh, man, he's up. All right. Hold up one moment. Bell. Mills, can you get uh, can you get Edison? He's awake. Thank you. All right. So you could see how immobilization here, how you can uh, quickly have an impromptu splint. You could take some uh, uh, dressing, right? And the difference between bandaging and dressing. Bandage uh, um, is uh, the bandaging is the thing that goes around uh, uh, your wound area. So you could take that stuff and uh, wrap it around here, and you will immobilize. And you notice no one's going to try to straighten his leg anything like that and you can see here another neat gadget you can use it uses also a pillow okay so back to sprains and strains sprains and strains are simply the overstretching of the joint space right so uh and when it overstretches there might be some damage uh to a ligament and to a tendon 
but the same thing will happen. It'll be swelling, there'll be immobility, loss of range of motion of that particular joint. But uh, for uh, medical purposes, a strain is any overstretching of a tendon, which is the connection between um, a bone, uh, a bone and muscle. And that's a strain with a T, S-T-R-A-I-N. But a sprain is the overstretching of a ligament, which is um, uh, the connective tissue between bone to bone. But either way, it causes a lot of pain. Actually, sometimes we even cast it, cast, uh, give a cast to the patient to uh, immobilize the joint space. So here's a common question that's in your AMA, CCMA, the different types of uh, fractures. Let's see if they have a, uh, a picture. Uh, no, let's, let's get a picture because this is nice having a summary, but uh, I like pictures. Types of fractures. picture uh, they have okay good they have everything so types of fractures now fractures can be either open or closed closed fractures are the best because it doesn't break the skin if you have an open fracture that means the bone is actually has broken through the skin and is now sticking out and that's a problem because uh, now you have um, um, a massive source of infection. If it breaks clean across, it's called a transverse, right? And if it's straight, it's a, a termed linear. If it's like diagonal a little bit, that's oblique. And this is oblique non-displaced. That means the bone is still in its proper alignment. But if you have a displaced oblique, and especially it's, and this is all the femur, your thigh bone, especially if it's like this, it's going to be a problem because you see it forms like a sharp edge. It could have a potential for a, uh, an open fracture. Spiral, it's a twisting. Okay. You can see how it's all like jagged. Now green stick, green stick happens with children less than five years of age. And you know uh, how they say bouncing baby boy, because uh, little kids don't have a lot of minerals uh, compared to an adult and their bones are growing and they're more pliable. They're more bendy, if that's a medical term. Well, when they get fractures, a lot of times uh, children under the age of five, they get partial fractures and that's called a green stick. It may bend, but it doesn't really break all the way through. And, um, and they call it green stick, just kind of like, you know, those uh, little small sapling trees that they're green. When you break them, they bend on one side, but, and then they crack on the other. And that's what a green stick is. Comminuted, oh, these are really bad to uh, try to do. This, is, this person's getting surgery. Comminuted when it's shattered, okay? Um, uh, um, a classic comminuted wound is a bullet wound. Now, the bullet doesn't necessarily have to hit your bone. Uh, the force of a, a force of a typical nine millimeter bullet, it is so powerful. It is not only the bullet itself, it travels with a shock wave and the shock wave is enough to smash and to make little bits and pieces out of your bone. And which is a nightmare. And also the other thing about bullets is it is dirty. A lot of pathogens on it. There's a lot of things on it uh, and powder on it and oil on it and makes the wound much worse. So these are your types of bone fractures. They can either be opened or closed, displaced, right? Out of alignment or non-displaced. And I've seen this green stick question on so many AAMA, CCMA uh, types, uh, type exams. Remember, less than five years of age, incomplete fracture very easy to heal. This comminuted, not so much. Alrighty. Okay, so uh, uh, complete, incomplete, green stick, comminuted. Uh, um, uh, those are all that we went over here 
uh, in our little table here. And I like pictures better. Now, head injuries, just like the fall, again, major thing that we're thinking of is, was the patient conscious, okay? And a concussion. Concussion uh, is a serious thing. It's not just getting hit in your head. There are associated uh, things, including loss of consciousness and uh, temporary loss of uh, your sensory, uh, cardiovascular, okay? And uh, uh, especially in the first, um, the first couple of times of a concussion, these symptoms disappear. Now, the bad thing about concussion is if you have enough of them, like myself, right? Uh, it'll lead to TIB, which is traumatic brain in a TBI, which is traumatic brain injury. Okay. And um, um, a lot of people uh, get, especially if you're an active child, and uh, I was one of those kids who liked to climb and fall out of trees and I skateboard, I surf, I snowboard. So I bash my head around a lot before the age of 18. And then military service, that did a number. Then years of uh, fighting in the ring. So TBI and all of those things lead to a lot of things like Parkinson's and a whole bunch of neurologic problems. So uh, especially concussions, especially with uh, children, um, uh, take note of it and um, Nowadays, we're really seriously looking at sports, uh, especially the contact sports, on uh, on uh, on the effects of concussions. My nephew, um, he loves basketball, but he had he's barely 14, 14, 13, 14 years old. He's had two really bad concussions already, and his doctor already advised him that he really shouldn't be playing uh, um, uh, playing ball anymore, um, because again, because future health. Uh, and, and whatnot. Okay. Now on a head injury, again, loss of consciousness, any respiratory issues, seizures, right? Now, another thing you, you should be also watching out for is if you see any blood or clear uh, fluid coming out of the ears or nose, that has to be noted because that clear fluid could be cerebrospinal fluid which indicates a, um, a skull fracture, okay? And of course, that's, that's very, very serious. I had a colleague of mine who didn't notice that, and uh, his, um, his patient was a, a teenage male. He went, uh, he, he went straight to a coma, and um, he had classic, he had very, very mild concussion symptoms, and nothing that would suggest a, a skull fracture, but uh, my colleague didn't, um, didn't notice he was sniffling and he just assumed it was uh, post nasal drip. And then later we found out that wasn't, you know, that wasn't post nasal drip, that was cerebrospinal fluid. And then the kid, uh, his pupils went fixed and dilated and then went into a coma and he eventually died. So you could see how whoever the first responder is and, and uh, or the first person to look at your patient, you really, really got to keep your eyes open and, and, and pay attention. There's also potential for a hematoma. Uh, uh, so look at, uh, inspect the skull. Are there any lumps or bumps? Or like, and, and also look at the history. How bad uh, did they really hit their, uh, hit their head? And again, try to assess if there was loss of consciousness. Okay, because a hematoma, oma means tumor, hemat means blood. So it could be, it, go, uh, it could now, and a cerebral hematoma, that's a serious thing. But a hematoma, uh, I go, it, could, it could just be like a, a bruise or a swelling of the head, but it could be an indication of even deeper stuff. So it's something to also note when you're doing your assessment of your patient. Your patient fell, take a good look at their head. See if there's any bumps, and uh, um, um, and again, uh, really get that history solid so you can uh, report it to uh, report it to your chain of command. Now, hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging is not just normal bleeding. Hemorrhaging is bleeding, okay? And one of the things that you're gonna learn, you're gonna see a video, or even you can do this little experiment when you're in your first aid class, that they take this fake blood and uh, they're in known jars 
of volume and they start pouring it on either the you know the uh, respiratory uh, mannequin or like an actual person um, when I was in EMS training we poured this fake blood of known volume over people uh, over uh, you know on the floor and so that we can know what 30 100 150 200 cc's look like remember from your anatomy and physiology a typical 70 kilogram or 144 pound male uh, has five liters of fluid in it if there's 20 percent loss um, there's going to be uh, the patient will go into shock shock is when um, the um, well hemorrhagic shock shock is when the patient can no longer supply oxygen uh, to its systems. And that's what we're trying to prevent when they're hemorrhaging. So the best is you take something that's very absorbent, hopefully something sterile, right? And then you make sure you pack the wound and you, uh, you apply um, direct pressure and you keep that direct pressure, okay? Uh, and if medical help is not available uh, readily, like quickly, um, you could utilize a tourniquet. A tourniquet is, um, uh, you could, it, it could be a string and a stick. Uh, 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 during my time, it was really easy. They didn't have a, uh, they didn't give us these fancy stuff that the military has now. Uh, it was, you just have your bandana and, um, um, and a couple of sticks and you put that you, you put that uh, somewhere on your body armor and that would be a, a really quick thing. Now with the tourniquet, make sure you have like a marker or something. Uh, you can even see the military. They have, uh, if, they, if you look at their plate carriers, a lot of them will carry pens and markers. Those things aren't only to mark up maps and things of that matter. They're also to mark up tourniquets. And you, uh, you're, when you apply the tourniquet, you put the time when you uh, applied the tourniquet. You cannot keep the tourniquet on forever. Uh, the tourniquet has to be loosened to maintain blood flow. Because remember, if the, if the distal portion of the limb doesn't get any blood supply, it will die. Okay, so the uh, tourniquet will uh, stop the hemorrhaging, but you got to let it loose every once in a while. And we're going to be looking at um, figure 57.57-3 in a moment. Uh, multiple injuries, again, you have to do your assessment. You have to do your C CABs. You start thinking of which are the things that's going to affect my circulation, my airway, and my breathing the most. Poisoning, make sure you have your poison control center uh, stickers and, uh, and all of that uh, readily available. So this is a tourniquet. My patient has a very, very bad laceration on their hand. It's hitting a major artery. My patient's bleeding. Direct pressure is not working. So you take uh, um, like a bandana or a piece of cloth, cloth you uh, wrap around the stick, and then you have another string or a piece of cloth or tape uh, to keep the tourniquet from coming loose. Now, what's the marker for? You put the time of when you put the tourniquet on and then other times of when you put the tourniquet off and put it back on, okay? Because you gotta let it go. And it's painful and it's, and, and um, I forgot the protocols for a tourniquet. Uh, you can look those up on how long uh, you leave the tourniquet on. I can't remember if it was like 15 minutes, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, but you can uh, look that up. But just know that you have to periodically um, take it off. The modern tourniquets, I wish I could uh, show you my, uh, my bag. Um, modern tourniquets have, uh, like it's all Velcro and there's like a stick and the stick, inside the stick is a pen and there's a place uh, where um, uh, you can write it right on the tourniquet on what time, it's really neat. And that's, um, I forgot the name of the, uh, the, the product, but, um, uh, that's what uh, modern military and modern EMS now have for tourniquets. Um, another way to control hemorrhaging is uh, it's called military anti-shock trousers. Maybe uh, 
maybe you've seen them or medical anti-shock trousers my day uh, um, so they look like these pants that look like um, uh, like one big blood pressure cuff and it's got like this foot pump here so if your patient's totally bleeding out especially abdominal and they have no pedal pulses EMS, you may see this in EMS uh, we slip on these pants, right? And then we pump this up and that will um, assure that all the blood stays in the cardiovascular area, especially if there's massive trauma to my patient's legs, uh, abdomen, and pelvic area. And these are called uh, MAST, M-A-S-T, or uh, medical anti-shock trousers. And remember the definition of shock. It is the body's inability to uh, deliver blood and oxygen uh, to its systems. And if you could no longer do that, uh, you will go unconscious and you'll go into heart failure. And there's different kinds of shock. Uh, of course, hemorrhagic shock, we already went through that. If you bleed too much, you're gonna go into shock. There's also neurogenic shock. Like if you get surprised or uh, maybe you got a stroke, of course, your body will, won't have the ability to deliver oxygen to where it needs to go. Um, um, volumetric shock, if your patient goes into dehydration, severe dehydration, even secondary from burns, your patient can go into shock. So you could see like there's this path to death that what we do is we're not really saving anyone's life, we're medically managing my patient so they don't go down this bad path. That's all that we do essentially as uh, clinicians. Uh, with poisons, uh, again, don't make the patient vomit, don't give the patient water or vinegar or whatever craziness that you may have heard. What do you do? You call the regional poison control center immediately, right? You monitor vitals uh, like every five minutes, right? And then uh, uh, watch out for nausea and vomiting. Do not induce vomiting unless you're directed by medical because sometimes the vomiting, especially if the material is caustic, right? And caustic is, uh, let's say, um, like for example, I had a patient, she, um, uh, she swallowed, she was depressed and, and, and going through some stuff. She swallowed like red devil lie. Well, guess what? When she swallowed it, it burned everything from her mouth all the way down to her stomach. And then she vomited it back up, right? And then guess what? It burned her, it burned her entire mouth, teeth, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, and stomach twice. And oh, it was just a nightmare. Uh, ugh, I remember that like it was yesterday. Um, uh, also, there's absorbed poisons, things that, uh, uh, that, that you may have touched. Again, a good history. Uh, inhaled poisons. Uh, again, get this patient. Uh, get uh, get this patient outdoors. Get this patient away from the source uh, of the inhaled poison. Okay, and you could see here carbon monoxide. Let's say maybe uh, they wanted to um, uh, commit suicide. They parked their car inside their garage. They could do that. But actually, a lot of my carbon monoxide experience, it was by accident. Um, I had a gentleman, he just parked his car, it was winter, so he closed all the doors and windows, and he wanted to do something in his, um, in his little workshop in his garage, and his wife found him, and they have a, a cherry skin appearance. Their, 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 their cheeks would be like bright red, and, um, and um, it, the thing about carbon monoxide is it holds on, uh, it holds on your hemoglobin a lot, uh, a lot stronger than oxygen. So if the carbon monoxide is holding on to your hemoglobin in your blood, your hemoglobin won't be able to pick up oxygen. So the patient will faint and then the patient will die of asphyxiation or like all intents and purposes, um, no oxygen. Weather, hypothermia, again, uh, uh, everything regarding hypothermia and frostbite is gradual. Um, uh, you're, you're gradually trying to build up the warmth in the area. And hypothermia and frostbite, usually uh, hypothermia is more of a systemic thing. 
uh, but uh, you will also have an associated drop in uh, core body temperature below uh, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember, normal is 98.6. Um, and then also they'll have uh, definite signs and symptoms. Uh, they'll have uh, circumoral pallor. Their lips will become bluish gray. And um, basic, um, uh, what do you call that? Basic questions like, um, uh, what time is it? What's your name? They won't be able to answer very well. Okay, uh, and that's hypothermia, and it's very, very dangerous. Okay, uh, and you, of course you move them inside, right? And but you warm them up slowly. Get rid of anything wet. Okay, and your patient will be confused, and then call uh, call EMS. Uh, uh, same thing with frostbite. Do not it goes. Uh, uh, you got to warm them up. Okay. And starting with the core, and then, uh, um, uh, and then of course call for uh, medical assistance. Now, now that it's summertime, heat stroke is going to be really, really common. Um, I've been in an entertainment business for like 30 years uh, uh, as a DJ, um, and um, every year I do um, beach parties and things, and it's amazing. Uh, all these people on the beach, they drink alcohol, lots of it. Well, the sun is coming down. That's already going to uh, dehydrate you, right? It's going to set you up for hypovolemic shock. You won't be able to sweat too much, right? And your temperature can raise over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we already know about fever is your body, is, it goes, your body at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is an, is a, optimal uh, uh, functioning temperature. So anything above 100, your brain will not like and you could go into a seizure. And then you add alcohol to all of that, all of this gets ramped up. And especially if my patient, uh, right, they're at the beach, they're having fun, they're sweating, alcohol, then they, they have vomiting because maybe they drank too much alcohol, then that's more dehydration and you find them passed out on the beach and uh, it, there could be some serious, serious problems with it. And they wake up with the worst hangover of their life. Okay, and it's kind of dangerous. Sunburn, again, that is a first degree burn. It is not trivial, especially if it's over 18% uh, um, of your body. Remember the rule of nines. Again, uh, and also, if you have a lot of sunburn exposure, there will um, there'll be a, um, a predisposition, especially if you're lighter skin, to basal cell carcinoma, ca uh, skin cancer. Uh, again, uh, for years I've been DJing beach parties and um, I am, well, maybe not this year. Uh, I uh, Bally's and a whole bunch of places didn't call me back, so we're not quite sure if that's happening this year. But uh, I just find it amazing uh, how a lot goes, how a lot of people ignore this, and it also sets you up for a lot of dehydration, and and also the same thing, first degree burn. Remember your skin. Your skin is your first line of defense. So if that goes, hmm, infection will follow. Okay. Open wounds. Now the different types of wounds. I hope there's a picture. I love pictures. Here you go. Know your different types of wounds. First wound is a contusion. If you see here, maybe we can get this closer, good. If you see here, it's just bruising. You'll just have uh, maybe some signs of ecchymosis here or bruising. And it's within the dermal layer. And uh, you know that in the dermal layer from your anatomy and physiology, there are uh, uh, arteries and veins. And if I hit somebody, you know, uh, uh, some of the blood vessels here might break, or if I grab somebody really hard, some of the blood vessels here may break. Incision, these are nice because you see how clean the wound is? Then you'll have good wound apposition. It'll be easier to sew this thing up because, and that's if somebody got cut with uh, a scalpel-like or something very, very sharp, right? Like a box cutter. Now, laceration, you can see how it's jaggedy. This is not good. Right, uh, so if someone got uh, so it has poor wound apposition, so this thing 
is going to have a serious scar. Puncture, of course, uh, you have a, a foreign object puncturing through uh, um, multiple layers of skin. Now, um, don't immediately remove the foreign uh, body, but you'll learn in uh, your first aid is if you do or if the patient does remove the foreign body, you clean and irrigate the skin as much as possible and you have a good history on what punctured you and make sure to uh, assess if your patient had their tetanus booster any time in the last five years. Last but not least, abrasion. Abrasions are scrapes and they only affect the epidermal layer. So it's not too, not too bad. And remember, when you do your wound cleaning, uh, you really gotta scrub the wound well, right? To get the wound to be clean. Because something, uh, some of these wounds, especially on the incision, laceration, and abrasion, where there is a break in the skin, you might have, if ever you notice, if you ever had a cut, there's this black stuff right? They look like, like, like flesh, but it's black. That's called eschar, E-S-C-H-A-R. That is necrotic tissue. That's dead tissue. So when you're cleaning or debriding a wound, and debridement is getting rid of the necrotic tissue, you got to really clean the edges and scrub the edges. Uh, even in these lacerations, well, we scrub even in here and here, so we make sure we get rid of all that necrotic tissue so that when we do close it up or we do bandage this up, uh, the, um, the likelihood of infection will be, de will be decreased. Oh, common disorders, abdominal pain. Uh, hmm. Oh, here's like some bandaging techniques. Nice to know. Again, they teach you all of this in um, uh, in uh, your first aid class. Or if you're just curious, right? Uh, uh, I have some of this material and uh, when we're in laboratory, in between taking turns doing blood pressures and stuff like that, uh, just ask me about it and I could, uh, I could quickly show you how to properly bandage and how to uh, properly anchor the bandage so it doesn't come apart. Now asthma. Asthma, of course, will uh, definitely affect your cardio, uh, why am I saying cardiovascular? Respiratory system. And remember what asthma is. Asthma is an exaggerated immune response uh, uh, towards the outside world. So for example, if I'm dusting my room, you know, there's a little bit of dust kicks up, right? Uh, I may cough, maybe sneeze, right? And that'll be the end of it. But the asthmatic uh, their immune system, especially in their lungs, will be exaggerated. So their bronchioles will close up. They'll have a lot of mucus and uh, they'll start coughing and they'll have a really hard time. Okay, so be very careful uh, with the, asthma, with the uh, history of asthma because they can go south very, very quickly. Dehydration we talked about. Diarrhea, uh, acute meaning it happened just right now. Uh, that's also related to dehydration. Diarrhea is very, very important with the very young and the very old. Syncope or fainting, um, that falls under uh, falls and under loss of consciousness. And again, get to that history and see if uh, what was the reasons for the loss of consciousness and also did they hit their head, uh, where did they fall, uh, things of that nature. Fever, we previously mentioned that fever, remember, a fever of like 100, around 100, even for an infant, is okay. It is our body's way of fighting the infection. But once the fever gets greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right, uh, that, that's when you should start taking ibuprofen, acetaminophen. These are NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, because if you have hyperthermia, which is uh, a fever of like 104, 105, 106, you can go into a seizure and potentially a coma because your body cannot operate in that high of a temperature. Your brain will start to cook for all intents and purposes, and it's not a good thing. And another thing that fever also does, even the low-grade fevers, is a promotion of dehydration. So for, for the very young and the very old, that's the consideration. Know your signs and symptoms of dehydration, especially 
for infants. Uh, for infants, uh, if you look at the baby, they'll have um, um, uh, they'll have a depressed fontanelle. You know the soft spot on the top of their head. It'll start you know caving in a little bit. If you look at a baby's eyes, they should be moist. You should be able to see your reflection. You're also looking out for any signs and symptoms of uh, uh, change in sensorium or change in personality. So if you have a happy, quiet baby, if they're going through dehydration, they're gonna be the most cranky and they're gonna cry and they're not gonna sleep. And the exact opposite may also happen. You may have a baby that's not responsive, all right? Uh, that they like to sleep all day and they're, they're not playing and they're not cooing and they're not making any sounds. So uh, again, um, when you're taking your history and you're talking to the caregiver, they know best. So uh, try to elicit um, uh, that history as well. Okay, so fever, not a good thing. Hyperventilation, uh, it could be also uh, um, a general anxiety disorder or, um, you know, uh, um, an acute uh, uh, attack. Uh, so it's something, uh, the best is to make sure the patient is in a quiet space with no, um, no distractions and, and no activity. So if someone's hyperventilating ventilating for whatever reason, you try to get them into a, uh, a, a relatively dark room with no sounds and your, your function is to uh, reassure the patient to get them down to a level where they can uh, breathe normally. Nosebleed, epistaxis, um, uh, you have the patient sit up and the head tilted forward, not back. You tilt it back, the blood will start running down their throat and they'll vomit. And also we want, uh, and, uh, and, and also you look at signs and symptoms of any head trauma or any history of a fall of that nature. Um, and if it doesn't get controlled, uh, it says no control of bleeding within 10 minutes. Um, for me, five. If you, can't, if you can't stop it in five minutes uh, and you even pinched off the nostrils for a minute or two, right? Um, uh, call, uh, activate your EMS. Tachycardia or any heart problems, again, uh, you assess it. If it doesn't go away, get it to, get it to the emergency room. It could be nothing, uh, and it could be everything. And of course, vomiting. With vomiting, is just like diarrhea. It, it is a potential for dehydration, and also just like diarrhea. Make sure to take a moment and and kind of guesstimate the volume of how much uh, diarrhea came out, or how much vomiting came out, and also what did come out. What was the color? Was there blood? Uh, was there whole chunks of food in it? Both diarrhea or vomiting. And these are nice things that uh, the emergency doctor uh, 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 would appreciate and like to know. Now, uh, these uh, less common disorders, uh, they're nice to read, um, but, but they're really dangerous. Uh, so anaphylaxis, we already talked about. That is an extreme allergic immune response. And uh, you need to get epinephrine to your patient, one one thousandth. Uh, I believe the, why am I quoting it if I can't remember it? Just epinephrine. Uh, make sure you have your EpiPen or, and if you don't, uh, give them Benadryl, get them to the hospital right away. Uh, meningitis, oh boy. If you have a patient who has any form of meningitis, Please don't be in the area. They're highly infectious. Now let's talk about something a little bit more uh, pertinent, which is diabetes. A diabetic patient can easily, especially if their diabetes is uncontrolled, can easily be super hyperglycemic, a lot of blood sugar, or hypoglycemic, too low of uh, blood sugar. Either situation is not good. Either situation will bring your patient into a coma. So, and what is a coma? It's when your brain shuts off because it doesn't like the atmosphere of which it's in. Now, hopefully the brain will turn back on, but we can't say that. And you can go into shock, right? If you don't have your insulin and you have se severe hypoglycemia, guess what happens? 
or if you have too much insulin, you go to severe hypoglycemia, it will lead to a position of your body will have, will have the inability to transport oxygen to where it needs. And of course, coma, don't want that, okay? And you can get into coma in either situation. A coma just simply means that your brain does not like uh, the situation that it is in. Now, heart attack, also known as an acute myocardial infarction, also known as an MI. Um, we're not afraid of the heart attack. I am afraid of the pending heart failure that's gonna happen after the heart attack. So that's why we have to deal with the heart attack. And the heart attack, if you recall from your anatomy and physiology, is, is, uh, is essentially there, one of your uh, coronary arteries got blocked and now there's no more oxygen getting to a significant portion of your heart. It's going to cause chest pain. The chest pain either uh, is usually left-sided uh, uh, or it could, be, it could be as high as the upper part of your sternum. There could be radiation of pain to the left arm and the left jaw because that's the innervation of uh, the nerves that connect to your heart around there. Or you could have a silent MI which is common with um, uh, diabetics. Your patient won't feel anything at all. They'll just be dizzy and they'll be wondering why they feel like, like, like garbage. But then when we take, uh, we, we, we take a, um, an EKG, there'll be, there'll be definite signs of a heart attack. Now, if your patient codes or um, uh, uh, doesn't breathe, you, you activate your EMS and uh, defibrillate if necessary. And many defibrillators, right? Uh, they can your AED, your automated external defibrillator. You know that little machine. Let's look at it. AED. They also train you that in the course that I was telling you about. Um, it's like you you press a set of buttons, and they have this little screen, and it tells you what to do. It tells you to put the stickers in the right place. Then it tells you you got to clear from your. Uh, your, your patient, you have to make sure everyone else is clear. And then uh, once everyone is clear, it'll press the button. Now, what does the defibrillator do? Fibrillation is when there is, there is no longer a coordinated uh, pumping of your heart. Therefore, blood won't go where it needs to go, and then you'll get cardiogenic shock. Then the cardiogenic shock will lead to uh, cardiac failure, and your patient will die. Right? So what do we do? We interrupt that we do the AED, and it zaps your patient with electricity. Uh, the best analogy, oh, of course, there's a picture here, and there's instructions, and there's a little screen that tells you what to do, which button to press. And um, uh, the analogy that I have it is, it's just like, uh, you know, like in cartoons where somebody lost their memory, and you hit them with a hammer, and then their memory comes back. Well, someone has an electrical problem, so what do we do? we hit them with some electricity. Uh, the thing is, if you hit somebody with a defibrillator and they don't have a, uh, um, a cardiac problem, they're gonna get a cardiac problem. So that's why when this thing's activated, stay clear, don't touch your patient. Once you put the stickers on, uh, these electrode things here on the patient's chest in the area that the picture told you to put it on, right? Uh, you press the red button and you stand back. Uh, respiratory arrest, of course, uh, do your uh, CPR. Hematemesis, which is blood. Again, your protocols for vomiting still apply. Uh, shock, we already told you about. Let's talk about seizure. The one biggest thing that I want you to know about seizure is keep the patient safe. Do not stick anything in their mouth. The, your only job is to keep everyone away and keep all furniture or anything that, that can hurt themselves away from their head and their body, okay? If they're going through a grand mal seizure, which is you know the typical seizure that you have, okay? And then when it's all over, get everyone out of the way because this patient's gonna wake up and they're gonna be confused and embarrassed, okay? And then at the end of it all, make sure you take vital signs and of course, uh, you activated your EMS and called 911. And shock, we already went through uh, basic BLS. Uh, that's uh, compressions. You'll learn that in um, 
what do you call it in CPR? Now, stroke. How do you know your patients have has a stroke? Know this acronym fast. Do you see any facial drooping, or does their face look funny, or uh, does their uh, does does their appearance look odd to you, uh, like they can't smile or they can't uh, they. Uh, um, the, they just look funny to you. A, arm. Is there any weakness, arm weakness or body weakness? They can't get up. Uh, they can't sit down properly. Speech difficulty. If your patient can't communicate, right? Or they're communicating oddly. Um, and then what's T? Time to go. Time to call 911. Okay? So that's fast. Okay? Now, this fast. Uh, when my wife was just in training, she had a class and just like this one, and it told her about it. Well, one morning, um, uh, my father-in-law, he didn't have facial drooping, but he looked odd. Didn't think anything of it. I just thought it was his meds. Then he couldn't get out of bed. And then when uh, my mother-in-law and my wife asked him, are you okay? Uh, he said something weird like uh, bubble guppies in June. He said something really bizarre. And from that, my wife then called me. I was, I was actually out the door. I was about to go to school, uh, go to work. I was actually out the door. And my wife called me and said these things. And I think, and she said, I think, I, I think Papa's having a stroke. So she was able to see all of that. And he was having a stroke. Uh, and we uh, got in the, I was already dressed. We got him, I got him into the car. We, we got to uh, the hospital. And just imagine if she didn't know this, then we, we would have thought that, oh, grandpa's just acting funny. And we would have left him there. And if we left him there, um, again, a stroke is a CVA, cerebral vascular accident. Uh, it is like a heart attack, but in your brain. Um, there's a, um, there's a um, obstruction to the blood flow in the part of the brain, and that part of the brain will start to die. There's something in the old CPR training called the golden five minutes. In five minutes, if your patient has either cardiac or respiratory arrest, there will be irreversible brain damage. Five minutes. And that's, uh, that's also part and parcel of the reason why medical professionals are very keen to time. All right, TSST, viral encep encephalitis, eh, not so common. Uh, toxic shock syndrome, you might see it. Uh, that's when, you know, you leave your tampon in too long and then it uh, has a massive infection and then you could have sepsis and uh, disseminating intrave intravascular coagulation, but it's rare, uh, usually with the homeless and me uh, mentally ill population. In my career, even in two years of EMS in New York City, I think I saw it once. I wasn't even sure. And she was probably septic for a whole bunch of other reasons. Now, let's talk about uh, hang in there last but not least. Let's talk about this one last thing, uh, psychological and psychiatric disorders. I want you to look at psychiatric disorders like a spectrum. Everybody here, myself included, we go a little bit nuts every once in a while. We get off the, the beaten path. So... What separates normal people from people with uh, psychiatric or psychological disorders is that, that a person with a psychiatric or a mental issue cannot snap back to normal uh, very well or at all. So here's an example. All of us go psychotic every once in a while. Osis, abnormal condition of, uh, of the mind. If, uh, if any of you have children, you know they can make you so angry that you there's there's a moment like, Oh, I could kill you. But you, of course you snap back and go, Oh my God, it's one of my babies. Oh, well, I'm having a bad day. But someone who's psychotic cannot snap back. Right. And a psychotic, they're not living in our world here. They're not living in reality. And if, with true psychosis, they can do things like kill babies, kill everybody, light everything on fire because they don't see they don't have any moral sense or moral judgment anymore. They're just so angry or they're just so afraid that uh, their, their abnormal condition or abnormal thoughts have already taken over and they can't come back. 
Now, there's also a neuroses, which is on the other side of the spectrum. All of us have our neuroses. All of us get nervous and get worried. Uh, every once in a while, I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't sleep because I'm thinking about my kid's future or, my God, did I pay enough taxes? Or uh, how am I going to... How am I going to afford this or afford that? Um, you know, but then what happens, right? You take a little glass of warm milk, you calm yourself down. Maybe uh, you watch a little Netflix and then you go back to sleep. But for a true neurotic, they can't go back to sleep. Their, their worries are constant. If you have a true neuroses and, and especially with paranoid ideation, these are people who are like, oh, the government's after me. Um, what am I going to do? There's a chip in my brain. There's a chip in everybody's brain. And you could see that it, uh, neuroses can also go by the way of psychoses as well. So dealing with these patients, the best thing to do is to understand them and to empathize with them and do not challenge them because you're going to have a problem. Right. The best thing to do is to keep them safe, and to uh, and to acknowledge and address their address their feelings and to empathize with them and to get them to the emergency room as quick as possible because either spectrum of this patient is a danger to self and others. Okay. Because just imagine if you're very very nervous and you feel like you're backed into a corner. What what may you, what could you do to yourself? You could, uh, um, uh, and major depressive dif disorder is a part of that as well. Let's say you're so depressed and your thoughts are, are already taking over, you start thinking of, oh, I'm going to off myself because there's nothing to live. You've got to get these people to help. And again, you acknowledge uh, their feelings. Uh, their feelings are real. Their pain is real, right? And do not challenge them, especially the, especially the psychotic. Do not make eye contact. Do not square your shoulders to that patient. Don't make any movements that'll look like that you're you're the aggressor. Okay, you and you and you give them their space because um, I've been assaulted twice in my career, and I can tell you both times was a psychotic patient that I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. I didn't pay attention, and one patient, uh, it was okay. Uh, she just slapped me. Uh, uh, another patient. Uh, she cut me with a spork. She tried to stab me in my neck because I didn't pay attention to her feelings and I didn't, uh, and she was like psych psychotic and she was a pill seeker and um, I got into an argument with her and I didn't, instead of, you know, de-escalating the situation, I escalated it and, you know, it's partially my fault. Um, and you could see that now with law enforcement. All this trouble that's going on now is because Many professionals forget that, that our job is to de-escalate situations, not escalate situations, right? So uh, that's what we do, especially somebody spitting in your face, somebody screaming at you, give them distance, don't engage, right? And then uh, get them the help. And if they're definitely a, de a danger to self and others, uh, there are other people within the team that will help you take care of that patient. Wow, that was a lot. But you could see is I'm trying to also condense uh, a lot of the emergencies. So you could see how this is all applicable to any ward you are in and, any, and even also situations that you have at home. Uh, do you have any questions on what's due today uh, or what's due next week and uh, what do we need to do and uh, what, did we go, what have we gone over? Because if we're good, I will conclude today's lecture and conclude today's video. No, I'm good. Good? I'll probably right. move on. Uh, Ms. Cadet, are you, I should have asked you in the beginning, it may have uh, made this uh, uh, lecture go faster. Uh, uh, do you work in the business already? I do not. Oh, I'm so some of the stuff that I may have told you may be something new, may have like, oh, maybe, Maybe I shouldn't work in uh, uh, this field. It's a little bit dangerous. But uh, no. <laughs> no, actually, um, like I said before, I was in school to do LPN. Oh, okay. So, like you, five so you know what you're getting into. So I do know. Mm -hmm. because, because some of these patients, like especially uh, the, the woman who assaulted me, who cut me, she cut me with a spork on my neck. Right? She was a pill seeker and she was a grandma grandma type. Oh, hi, sweetie. Hi, honey. But when I realized she was a pill seeker, I kind of got 
uh, I kind of got aggressive with her and pissy. I started going, yeah, whatever. You know what? You're not getting squat from me, but I didn't say squat. Right. All right. <laughs> don't, don't, don't fool me. Okay. I got 68 other patients lady and you're wasting my time. So, and she's already psychotic. So now I'm engaging on her. I'm challenging her what she did. Mother jumper, are you going to give me? And then next thing I know, I feel a, a, a sharpness on my neck. Mm -hmm. and I see blood and I'm like, what the? And here's the bad thing. I reacted physically. And what did the nurses see? All they saw, they didn't see her attacking me. All they saw was me pushing an elderly patient into the hallway. Right. So I got charges. And I had to defend myself. It took me like six weeks to defend myself in the, in, in the board. But then they looked at the, they looked at the evidence I had a cut on my neck. Um, and she, she was still holding the spork and attacking all the nurses. Now, if, and I was a young resident, I was a first year resident, so I didn't know better, right? How to tro control my emotion. Just right. imagine if I go, hey, like, like when I got better at it, I started doing things like, um, you know, ma'am, it goes, you know what? He goes, I see you really, really want those pills. Let me talk to my, um, let me talk to my attending, see if I can get you those. Mm -hmm. When in reality, am I really going to get her pills? No. no, but you can see how I'm working with her. I'm calming her down. Maybe get her some placebos, maybe get her some methadone. She'll be mad, but at least she'll have something. Right. Isn't that a better way to deal with people? Yes. Right? It is. Uh, and you could see just um, like one of my favorite shows is cops because I, I goes, I like seeing how the veterans deal with situations and you could see the rookies. They, they deal with it all wrong. Like, you know, they come out of the car all heated and they come out and go, hey, put your hands up, put your hands up. And they start yelling. Well, why are you doing that? Yeah, it's going to make everyone crazy. And if you're already psychotic, you're already on drugs and there's a gun in your glove, what are you going to do? You're going to start engaging. All right. So yes, there is, of course, a, uh, obviously from everything that's going on now, there's a racial component, but there's also a professional component. I do not believe a lot of these professionals are being reminded of their oath and being reminded of what is your job. Your job is service. Mm -hmm. And that's what I keep, that's what I forgot when I was assaulted, that I'm there to serve this patient. I'm not there to yell at her. I'm not there to be her dad and to, to, to wave a finger at her like, oh, you drug addict. That's my personal opinion. I hate crackheads. My personal opinion, I, I, they, take, they take away services from my patients who really need it. That's the reason why your grandma is in the hallway dying because I have to deal with this person who's taking up space in her room. But that's my personal opinion. And I forgot I should leave my personal opinions at the door. Mm -hmm. And I treat everybody like they were my mom, like they were my best friend, even though they're not. And I learned my lesson because later on that year, uh, guess who I got to take care of? This guy, he was like a neo-Nazi kind of guy. Mm -hmm. The whole ward, of course, this is New York City, is people of color, right? And oh my gosh, every day he would get into altercations with the entire staff, right? And you know, Nazi guy, who was the attending? It was a Jew. And that made it worse. And then who's everyone around him? All brown people. And he was, every day you had to hear it, the mud races, the this and that. But then I learned my lesson. Internally, I'm angry. I don't want him in here. Internally, I don't want to take care of him, but this is my job. I have to stabilize him. I have to get him well, and I have to get him out of here. And no matter how much I think of this person, I can't, uh, you know, I can't let that, you know. So how many rapists are you going to take care of? How many child molesters are you going to take care of? Right? But that's our job. Right? Uh, yeah, and, and that's hard. It's like I, when I was in EMS, I, like, I found it really hard because especially if you're, t you're treating a criminal, someone who just hurt somebody or shot somebody, but I have to treat them. And it, and I, it was in the beginning, it was really hard, but then, you know, you take all of this and, um, uh, and, and then you make sure you take emotion out of the equation. Now, one, la uh, one other question. Um, uh, did you, did you attend last night's, um, uh, nursing orientation thing like uh it was like a q a for nursing no i didn't okay um uh, i'm gonna be having like i'm gonna be making like a little video and stuff and i'm going to be getting a list of uh people such as yourself who are in health science um so that you guys know the skinny about all the requirements and everything and all the due dates and okay. that'll be in a couple of weeks 
okay? Because I have to deal with the laboratories first. So uh, probably by the end of the term, I'm gonna get this video out. And so, uh, and then uh, as your, um, are you an Alexandria student? No, Woodbridge. Oh, okay. So you can also uh, 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 speak to, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tampa about it as well. But um, I noticed last night there were, a, there were some Alexandria students but I'm like, oh, where are all my students? So I'm now gonna probably in the next couple of weeks start contact, uh, contacting all the people who weren't at this um, uh, at this thing last night. Okay, and I'm sure they're gonna have another one. They're gonna okay. have multiple ones. But I, I, I wanna get like, you know me, I like little mini videos, uh, makes our lives a little bit easier. So Ms. Cadet, thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, and welcome, welcome. Uh, uh, at least one person showed today, that's also a plus. <laughs> Right, but again, I know because uh, I believe the other two are working. Uh, um, it's all recorded. So if you don't make it, you don't make it. Make sure you see the recording. Make sure you do your quizzes and your discussions. Well, all right, Mr. Dent, have a good one. You too. And I'll see you next week. All right. All right. Have a good one. Bye.